What a glorious day that God has given us to worship Him and to bring His Word and uh, knowledge to the people. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I'm Dr. Stephanie, your host, along with my co-host, Pastor Karen Weitzman, and together we welcome you to Living the Word. Did you come expecting to receive today? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from God, so get that expectation level elevated, folks. When you come expecting to receive from God, you will gain wisdom, insight, and understanding and make a, a better revelatory connection with your heart and mind. So open your hearts and prepare to receive. You know, Pastor Karen and I will be bringing you understanding and practical application of God's Word to your life, and we will discuss the commandments that Jesus gave us in our blood covenant, His statutes, His ordinances, and how to operate in them in our daily life. We will not only be imparting God's wisdom, we will also be giving you insights into our God and His character to help you grow in Christ. So stay with us and learn how to apply and walk successfully in, the living, in living the Word. Good morning, Pastor Karen. Good morning, Pastor Stephanie. How are you? I'm great, great, great. And it's sunshine in here. It's been raining before, so I'm glad we have a sunny day. <laughs> yeah, we do too. It's beautiful out. Yeah, I'm really a sun person. I'm not into this gray. I don't like gray. <laughs> yeah, me too. But we both live in beautiful places. Yes, so we do. That do not are not gray. So. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah to that. All right, right now, folks, take a second to assemble a small piece of bread or cracker, a swallow of some sort of beverage or juice, set it aside, because later on we're going to pray over it, sanctifying it as the body and the blood of Christ. I want you to know also, we have a chat room that you can enter into during the program to ask questions and make comments, and we will address them later on in the program. Now, let's begin right now by inviting the Holy Spirit to join us. Pastor Karen, will you open us in prayer? Yes. Okay. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you today for the teaching on grace that we're going to be continuing this week. We've been saved by your grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. Father, this is favor that we didn't deserve, but you loved us deeply to send your son Jesus to be the propitiation for our sin. As we delve into this study today, grant us wisdom to open up this topic to reveal to us how all your promises to us are given through the gospel of grace. Lead us in love and faith, for we are not under the law, but operating in love as a result of the impartation of grace in Jesus personified. You are holy, Lord. We invite Holy Spirit to... Uh, be in, in this program today. Our desire, Lord, is to delight you and be holy as you are holy. Let our lives be worshiped to you and a living sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I agree 100% on more. <laughs> All right, today we're going to continue our discussion on grace, and we'll be touching on the gospel that Paul preached. Uh, we have to come to grips with the idea that forgiveness of sins is a basic teaching uh, and think about it as if it was really, uh, if it really was basic. I mean, why is it that so many believers miss it and are defeated by their lack of understanding? Well, the power of the gospel is to live each waking moment having the confidence that all your sins have been forgiven. Contrast that with living with a perpetual sense of guilt and condemnation that comes with thinking that when you sin, fellowship with God is broken and he no longer answers your, your prayers. I lived that for so many years you can't believe it. <laughs> He's far away from you and until you repent and confess all your sins, the Holy Spirit won't return. Well, do you know that many Christians still have this impression that the onus is on them to keep God's forgiveness by their own doing or not doing? So how can forgiveness of sins be a basic teaching? Well, there are too many believers, even pastors and preachers and leaders, with uh, uh, well, wonderful titles and Bible school credentials who are still confused about the teaching of forgiveness. The best way to understand the gospel, therefore, is not to base it on what you have heard from various sources, but to go back to what the apostles preached in the early church. 
Let's examine what the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the New Covenant, preached. After all, Paul was the Apostle whom God appointed to preach the Gospel of Grace, and he received more revelation on the New Covenant of Grace than any and all of the other Apostles put together. And he was responsible for writing more than two-thirds of the New Testament. Now in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 10, it says this, And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Observe how the Holy Spirit describes this man. Number one, he was without strength in his feet. Two, he was crippled from his mother's womb. And three, he had never walked. The Holy Spirit... I think... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, I think this is, you know, a really important verse. Um, not only does it describe what, how faith and the application of the gospel of the Holy Spirit or the application of the gospel of Jesus mm -hmm. can heal us, but if you think about it, it also describes the condition of our spiritual state before we receive Jesus. Amen. You know, we're in, the, we're in darkness, we're, we're without strength, we're crippled. <laughs> we Amen. Don't know, we, we don't know how to walk. That's right. Uh, but... But we also, in our spiritual life and, and in our physical life, once we hear the gospel of grace, as, as you're going to go on and explain uh, the good news of the gospel, we are delivered from, uh, we're immediately delivered. We can be immediately delivered. Amen. Amen. Good word. And now, as Pastor Karen was saying, the Holy Spirit used the three different descriptions to emphasize how the man couldn't walk was seemingly facing an impossible situation, and yet when he heard Paul speaking, he was filled with faith immediately to be healed. Well, how did he come to be filled with faith? The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, right? Actually, mm -hmm. um, the man at Lystra was filled with faith because he heard the Word of Christ. Now, I know that the Bible translations say faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, just like I just got through saying, but if you study the original Greek word, for, uh, in the Greek, I mean, the word for God here is not theos, for God, but rather Christos, for Christ. So you see, faith does not come by simply hearing the word of God. Why? Because the word of God would encompass everything in the Bible, including the law of Moses. There is no impartation of faith when you hear the Ten Commandments preached. Faith comes only by hearing the word of Christ. And this doesn't mean that you should only listen to preaching from the portion of the Bible that is printed in red, indicating that Jesus spoke those words, because red lettering uh, in those portions that Jesus spoke was devised by man to enable ease of recognition on our part. To hear the word of Christ is to hear preaching and teaching that have been filtered through the new covenant of grace and Jesus' finished work at the cross. Now you can preach from Genesis to Revelation from the perspective of Jesus and his grace. I preach and teach extensively from the Old and New Testaments. After all, Christ is in the Old Testament concealed and in the New Testament revealed. And in the Old Testament, you'll find shadows of Christ in the five Levitical offerings, the tabernacle of Moses, and even in the high priest's garments. But it takes a new covenant minister to draw Christ out. Only when Christ is preached will faith be imparted. Hallelujah. Any comments? Well, I think that grace has always been God's standard for accepting people by faith rather than works. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, I mean, yes, I think we should bring Jesus out, but I think the Old Testament, as you said, is Christ concealed because even the Ten Commandments were fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament by, by the two commandments, mm -hmm. which revealed, you know, love your love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. We have a little trouble with the second one, <laughs> but it, and you remember Habakkuk chapter two verse four tells us that the just shall live by faith. So the law is kind of like the mirror that brings us out of out of denial. We're in denial about our sin. I think that's why we we stay in the law because. Um, uh, we're den we're in denial about uh, our our sin, and it's that it's that law that where we have to look at ourselves, and we have to expose that yes, we are sinners, and we have to come to an end of ourselves and and see the need for our Savior, Christ. Mm -hmm. So actually, when we if any of us out there are in services where we're not hearing the gospel of Christ preached, we're not hearing the glory of Christ preached. Then we may be in the wrong we may be in the wrong church because that's the point of every sermon, 
is um, is hearing about Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, yes, that's true. My point in saying that it takes a New Testament minister or preacher to draw Christ out of the of the Word is that if you're a New Testament preacher and not just preaching the Old Testament for the Old Testament's sake, but yeah, Old Testament preachers have a tendency to preach the law. Right. You know, and emphasize it. But a New Testament preacher is one who has been enlightened about who they are in Pastor, Christ. Pastor, I'm losing I'm losing I'm losing you for some reason. You're getting you're getting um you're getting stuck or oh, something something's some, I'm going cutting on. out. Yeah, you're cutting out. Wow. Okay. Well, I I don't see it anywhere. Let me it doesn't show up anywhere like I'm having difficulty. You're fine now. Okay. You're fine now. Um, okay. <clears throat> anyway, so my point was that a New Testament preacher is one who knows who they are in Christ, and they preach from that perspective so that they go back in and draw Christ out of the Old Testament, Christ out of the New Testament, so that we, we get where our sea legs, so to speak, and we know where we're going. Um, right. So let's get back to the man at Lystra. What could Paul have been preaching that was so powerful that it imparted such faith to this man? so that he could believe for healing in his impossible, seemingly impossible situation. Uh, well, I've had pe people say to me that, Pastor Stephanie, I think Paul was teaching uh, divine healing. Well, let's look at the passage. The Bible says only that Paul was preaching the gospel in Lystra. It doesn't say that he was teaching divine healing. So don't misunderstand me. There's a place for teaching divine healing. I have a whole series on that, and I am a healing teacher. <laughs> so <laughs> I wouldn't say that, that he wasn't. But faith for divine healing can also come when you're simply hearing the gospel. Anyway, I wanted you to know what Paul preached at Lystra so that I could preach the same. I wanted to know, uh, and I want you to know too, so that I could preach that same message and impart faith to people. I mean, how could the Holy Spirit leave out something so important? If only he had recorded it in the Bible, and then the Lord told me that he had. He recorded one of those one of Paul's sermons in the Bible, and he told me to go to that previous chapter, and he showed me right there in Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit had preserved a sample of the gospel that Paul preached everywhere he went. So there it was, Paul's sermon recorded for us by the Holy Spirit, word for word. Paul covered quite a lot of ground, folks, but you have to see for yourself what the main thrust of Paul's sermon was and where it climaxed. Acts 13, verse 38 through 39. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Wow. Now the power of the gospel that Paul preached is found in the forgiveness of all your sins. For everyone who believes, there is no other qualification for being uh, forgiven of your sins. The Old Covenant was based on justification by works, obedience to the Ten Commandments. You had to perform to be forgiven. But the New Covenant of Grace is based entirely on justification by faith, believing in Jesus Christ. Can you see the radical difference? I mean, it is a radical difference. Yeah, we've been talking about that, um, the mm -hmm. difference of works and faith now for two or three weeks. So uh, hopefully the, you know, our viewers will, or our viewers and our listeners uh, will be able to change that picture in Amen. their mind. You know, they'll uh, be able to, st if they are in a works oriented mode, they'll be able to put their focus upon Jesus now and, and his, and realize that they're righteous. That's right. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's all right. You didn't cut me off at all. I was just commenting along with you. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, one of the main things that we need to point out is this, and I know it's redundant, but you need to hear it. The demand, under grace, the demand is no longer on you, but on Christ. And this is the good news. All who believe in Jesus receive the forgiveness of all their sins and are justified from all things. Good news. Hallelujah. There's no better news than that. I can just imagine how that man at Lystra responded when he heard Paul proclaiming that he could be justified from all things if he only believed on Jesus. I mean, when he heard Paul preaching about the good news of Christ, faith came in and flooded his entire heart. With tear, I can see him. With tears in his eyes, he must have turned away from his lame feet and rejected every thought that he had ever had about being lame from birth because he was punished for his parents' sins because that's what they believed. 
sins of the fathers, you know. Instead, mm -hmm. he must have believed with all of his heart that if he believed in Jesus Christ, he would be forgiven of all sins, all of his sins. So probably, choked up with tears, he whispered, I believe. And that at that very moment, he heard a loud voice saying, Stand up straight on your feet. And it was Paul commanding him. And before he had time to hesitate, he found himself leaping to his feet, ecstatic with joy. And for the first time in his whole life, he walked. Wow. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice something. Paul did not lay his hands on the man to heal him. There wasn't an altar call for those who wanted healing. The faith to be healed came from just listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> I personally in my ministry have experienced this time and again. As people are hearing the gospel of grace and Jesus' finished work is being explained to them, healing miracles take place. I don't have to have anything to do with it. I'm just the vessel, what's the mouth speaking, the, the, the word that God is whispering in my ear. You know, um, I'm sure you've had experience like that too, Pastor Karen, where you've seen miracles after miracles, where it doesn't take the laying on of hands every single time. We, we know together, we know that there is no distance between God and, and His work, so that when we pray in the Spirit and lay hands on people in the Spirit, they receive if they're in, in, in a mental attitude to take it and understanding. Um, I just know that the last, uh, I was at the nursing home last week, mm -hmm. and um, I was talking about um, Acts 13 and preaching it a little bit, and mm -hmm. one of the ladies had uh, a back problem. And, of course, we, we, we spoke about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then I... I did lay hands mm -hmm. on, and that night I saw her again, and she said her back pain had been alleviated. Praise the Lord. So uh, I'm going to talk the gospel more, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk the, gos the gospel more because, I, you know, it's something that uh, we think about the altar call. We think about laying on of hands. We think about Jesus' words. But um, there's power. There's the Holy Spirit, there's enabling power of the Holy Spirit to work just by talking about Jesus Christ being resurrected and and mm -hmm. and just by uh, explaining the gospel to people and I think that that's uh, that's why Jesus said it is in the Great Commission uh, go out and preach the good news to everyone that's right well God sent his word Jesus Christ to heal them <laughs> you know right <clears throat> and right. Then, and he's still the word even if he's invisible you know so the word the word heals and it doesn't take I, I guess my point is to that I was trying to make is that it doesn't take us doing something, the doing of it. If the person has ears to hear and their heart yes. is receptive, you Amen. just lay that word out there and it heals them, you know. And uh, I'm not poo-pooing the laying on of hands. Please do not get me wrong. I no. believe wholeheartedly in the laying on of hands. And I know that <clears throat> because we are a touchy-feely uh, fleshy persons, you know, we come from that. It's easier if I reached out with to touch you and I put my hand out and I reach out to you, you would normally, or anybody for that matter, would normally reach out to take whatever they thought was in my hand. I was trying to give them. And uh, it's because we do touch one another. It's it's kind of a bonding thing. You know, we, we need that touch to make us feel like we're getting something. And this is the, the thing that I want to point out. I've seen in my own ministry, because I, I have a healing ministry, that when I have uh, laid hands on people and they they don't they don't receive it. They think they're getting it and then they go home and they have a twinge or whatever from or something a recurrence of a symptom and they think, Oh, I must not have gotten it because it's not the norm to feel anything happen when you lay hands on someone. Now, we right. see people all the time that go forward for prayer, hands are laid on them by the pastor and they get knocked down, slain in the spirit. That that is true. There is power there. But that doesn't always happen. But everybody thinks that it has to. So if they don't get slain in the spirit, they don't think they got anything. The, the fact of the matter is the laying on of hands by the presbyter or the, the parish or person or the minister, um, uh, it, when they lay hands on them, the healing anointing is transferred from God through them into the body. And it's not normal to feel anything. It's more normal not to. And then you go away and you think, I didn't get anything because I got a symptom. Forget it. The symptoms are going to come because the enemy doesn't want you to know that you were healed, that you received mm -hmm. that healing power. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is when you get a twinge or a symptom, you just turn around and thank God for your healing. 
thank you for healing me. Thank you for the healing power of God. God that's coursing through my body, healing me from anything that would come against me from the enemy. And voila, you're stirred it up, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, now we're talking healing. I'm on a rabbit trail. But anyway. <laughs> well, that's okay. But I mean, I mean, what we're saying here is that all we have to do, we can receive better if we know, hey, I'm hearing the gospel. That's right. I can receive my, I'm hearing the gospel of grace, mm -hmm. you know. And so as if we know that just hearing that we could receive healing, that's going to stir us, stir us up to receive healing. That's Even right. More. That's right. And then it prepares you. If you want laying on of hands, yay, because we want to lay hands on you. We do because we know that the anointing is there and it will come forth and what it does. Uh, but if you don't get laying on of hands and you need it, you can pray with someone and they can just speak. You can receive your healing through the spoken word. I could say, Pastor Karen, you're healed in the name of Jesus. But your chances of, you, you, I no doubt would receive it. But your chances as a layperson just coming in of receiving it just because we spoke it to you and you lack understanding of that. So it, you, you might not believe it as quickly as if we lay hands on you and you feel something. Just hands, you know. Now, <clears throat> I know that for me. People do feel something as a rule because it's not necessarily a, a, a slain in the spirit. But my hands, the palms of my hands get like fire and it's really hot. And I've been held, holding hands in a prayer circle with people and they let go and shake their hand and go, Quick, your hands are too hot. But we're praying and the anointing's there, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and they don't realize it's the healing anointing. And if they had anything wrong with them, all they had to do was go, I receive that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but, um, and, and, there are manifestations like that that God gives us. I'm not saying that there aren't. Actually, I think that laying on hands is a marvelous thing, and it's a, a really a wonderful gift from God. Um, and as born-again believers, it is our job to lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Not they might, they shall, they will. Mm -hmm. So that when you lay hands on someone, and you, if you're a born-again believer, you're commanded to do it. It's one of the statutes of, and one of the ordinances of, of Jesus Christ. Go out there and lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover, and know that they will. I think what stops people from doing it is in just a, a person that's not necessarily uh, uh, called into the fivefold ministry is that they're afraid that somebody's going to ask them a question they can't answer. <laughs> don't be afraid of that. All you have to do is say, you know what, I don't know, but let's look it up together. I'll come back next week or I'll come back in two days and we'll, you spend time in the Bible looking it up. I'll look it up and we'll compare notes and we'll get to it together. Amen. It's, it's easy. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid of showing yourself to not know anything. Nobody expects you to know everything. Share what you know and what you don't know. Look up together in the Word of God. All right. Anyway, well, I was... we, we, uh -huh. we need to remember that we have the enabling power of the Holy Spirit within us mm -hmm. that will help us wipe away fear, that will give us the words to speak at the time that we need to speak them. And so we need to trust in trust in in jesus amen that we have that we have the authority to go forward that's right and do do what we're called to do that's correct amundo that's so true now um make sure that you are hearing the gospel that paul preached like uh, pastor sharon or karen was telling you earlier i'm sorry i didn't mean to say that name um that's okay um the bible declares that the lord bore witness to the word of his grace granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So you see, the Lord bears witness only to the word of his grace. So if you are believing the Lord for miraculous breakthrough or you want to see more power in your life, body, finances, career, and ministry, then be sure that you are hearing the word of grace, of his grace, and not the word of his law. And by the way, look at how Paul had to preach first before the Lord could bear witness to the word of his grace. Signs and wonders. Preaching the good news first is always consistent with Jesus' style. Anytime you go to a healing service, if the word of God isn't preached first before the healing uh, altar call to come up to, for healing, which I don't know, I've never been in one that wasn't, then get up and leave because you're wasting your time. The power for, the, for healing, the power of God, always follows the Word of God. Okay? Always. And remember that. So that if you're not hearing the Word of God first before some other event that you're there to receive from, I don't care what it is, not just healing. Anything. Revelation, uh, uh, move of the Holy Spirit, uh, 
I don't even get the glory cloud. It won't come without the word preceding it. Okay. So, um, everywhere he went, Jesus went, he went teaching and preaching to the multitudes before healing them. So I encourage you to hear the gospel of grace because faith will be imparted to you as you hear more and more of Jesus. And the gospel of grace is Jesus. Okay, you will stop being preoccupied with yourself, your lack, your weaknesses, and you'll become fully occupied, fully persuaded with Jesus, his beauty, his perfection, and his grace, and that grace is your gift. Now, <clears throat> and I thought it interesting that uh, you pointed out that Acts 13 was an anointed message that Paul gave mm -hmm. with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I went back, and, and our listeners may want to go and read and, and hear his message on grace because it was beautiful he was talking to the hebrews he mm -hmm. was talking uh, uh uh from the time of uh them being led out of egypt them being led out of egypt and uh how they rejected christ but that he uh has forgiven all sins and it's just beautiful how he explains it Mm -hmm. And uh, he talked about how David had died but did not have a resurrected body. Only Jesus did. Um, and John the Baptist, you know, died, died, did not have a res the resurrected body. Only Jesus did. It, it, actually, I had never really uh, had seen uh, Acts 13. I saw it in a different way after receiving this message that you brought to us today. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that's good, because there's, it just saw a, a, a little deeper, probably. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen after you begin walking in the grace message and believing in it and receiving that gift. Miracles and signs and wonders are going to follow you. And before, you, as you get, you grow in it, as you gain more knowledge and more practice in operating in it, they're going to precede you. <laughs> The, those signs and wonders and miracles. Now, one of the things I want to touch on today is um, the unpardonable sin. Because everybody is afraid of that. And I was. And uh, ever since I was a young Christian, even before I was born again, uh, a born again believer, I had heard of the unpardonable sin. I'm, I think most people have. You know, deep down, secretly, and finally, openly, I worried personally. Uh, that that particular thing like an old bone. I was terrified that I'd commit it somehow without knowing what it was. I didn't know what it was. We have to understand too that I was not discipled once I was born again. No one discipled me into the body of Christ. I had been um, brought into a church doctrine, but that uh, that didn't fit me. <laughs> you know, so uh, I, I wasn't uh, discipled into the body of Christ. And there's a difference because discipleship, true discipleship, is into the body of Christ. It has nothing to do with the church you go to or, um, or uh, their doctrine and uh, all their ri ritualistic stuff. It has to do with what Jesus Christ has done for you and what you do in, out of love for him uh, in your lifestyle. So anyway... Yeah, right. I think at some point mm -hmm. in time in in anybody's walk with the Lord, uh, we're, we're going to go through times and periods that we felt that we have fallen short in some area, not only the impartable sin, which I've been there also, mm -hmm. but um, all of us. And this, I think this points out how important dis discipleship is, that we all need someone guiding us and discipling along the way uh, to help us rule and reign. You know, yeah. Amen. I agree with you, one hundred percent. Because otherwise, we don't learn who we are. We are. We never learn who we are. Or we're thirty, forty, fifty years born again believers and uh, old people, wrinkled up and gray haired, and we still don't know about the unpardonable sin. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're still living in fear, mm -hmm. and that's the enemy's tack, not God's. Um. After a great deal of prayerful contemplation before the Lord and study of God's Word and totally being led by the Spirit, I have come to know, not just to think, but to know that the teaching that says that all sins can be forgiven, but if you commit the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, there is no forgiveness. That is an erroneous teaching. Now, I'm not saying that the Scripture is wrong. I'm saying that the teaching that goes with it is wrong. 
how that that's how this sin came to be known as the unpardonable sin. Let me explain. Uh, and this is just a little personal attack. And uh, jump in any time you want to, Pastor Karen. Okay. I was plagued, folks, by a lack of understanding of why other Christians didn't seem to be affected by the thought that they could actually commit the unpardonable sin. It, it was beyond me. Uh, as for me, I was really frightened. My conscience was very sensitive, and the more I thought about the possibility of committing the unpardonable sin, the more I was convinced I had probably already done it. Why? Because I lacked understanding in that area. My thoughts regarding the unpardonable sin became increasingly negative, and I even started to slide into doubting God. Now, this, of course, gave me more reason to believe that I had already blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Now keep in mind here that I have already taught you how the enemy works. He uses deception, distraction, always attacks in the area where you are ignorant of God's word. All right? So you can see the pattern emerging. And probably one thing that you did and that all of us have a tendency to do, we mm -hmm. talked about it last week, was running away mm -hmm. from God instead of running toward God. Exactly. We, you know? Yeah. I'm sh I've done that also. Yeah, I, I did. You're exactly right. I was afraid, so I ran away. <laughs> you run away yeah. from what you don't understand, you know. Mm -hmm. um, when I asked the leadership in the churches I'd attended, or, or others whom I thought would know because I thought they were, you know, living holy lives and were pinnacles of uh, uh, and bastions of holiness, hoping to get some kind of relieving news to help me understand, I was told that I, it was possible for a Christian to commit the unpardonable sin. So, oh, uh, I was set a sail immediately on a sea of oppression from the enemy. And the devil had riddled me with guilt and condemnation, and I didn't even know what the unpardonable sin was. But whatever it was, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which I had no clue what that was, I was sure I had done it and was on my way to hell. Now, God's grace in my life didn't count. You see, I figured I had unforgiven sin in my life, and there was nothing I could do about it. Plus, I didn't know what the unforgiven sin was so that I could repent from it. I hadn't yet learned about the cleansing blood of Jesus. I had learned but by this time about Jesus dying for my sins, and, and that was washed in his blood, but I didn't understand the cleansing blood part completely. No one informed me that my behavior was actually dishonoring the blood of Christ and negating Jesus' work on the cross for me. I had heard the good news according to the denominated doctrines that I had been sitting under, but I didn't understand the word when I read the, the Bible, so I quit reading the word. I just put the Bible away. I would, what I actually thought was that my sins were greater than God's grace. And it was during this tumultuous time that I actually began to understand the grace of our Lord Jesus. I know now, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that a Christian cannot, I repeat, cannot commit the unpardonable sin. I'm going to repeat that. A born-again believer, a Christian, cannot commit the unpardonable sin. Amen. Now, I admonish you to be very alert. When you hear any teaching that gives you the impression that believers, born-again believers, and it's born again, you have to be born again, can commit the unpardonable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, Warning, Will Robinson, research the doctrine involved there. Because there are times when the devil plants negative thoughts about the Holy Spirit in your mind. Or when you think or maybe even say something negative about the Holy Spirit. This, no doubt, will lead you to wonder and even uh, for some become concerned that you may have committed the unpardonable sin. And then the hair shirt goes on and you torture yourself. Well, let me declare once and for all that there is no sin that a born-again Christian is not forgiven of. When you understand yeah. why God sent the Holy Spirit, you'll realize that the unpardonable sin is simply this, to consistently reject Jesus Christ. Karen? And I was just going to say for those listening today, Hebrews 8, 12, For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sin no, no more. First um, John, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all, uh, all that's all, unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. And the blood covenant. This is my blood of the new covenant for remission of sins. And there's so many, so many more scriptures to uh, back up the Lord, the Lord's blood and the power of the blood and His not holding uh, sin against us. Amen. But that's true. Go on. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but you said the problem is. Uh, is when we can if if someone consistently rejects Jesus. Mm -hmm. Who and, does that? 
and I don't know anyone that does that. Well, the unbeliever does it. The unbeliever, okay. Mm -hmm. The unbeliever consistently rejects Jesus. They have an opportunity, they reject it. They have an opportunity, they reject it. You know? Yeah, and, uh, and we mm -hmm. see that Jesus wasn't talking, you're going to go into this in more mm -hmm. detail, but he said he, w he wasn't talking against the prostitutes or the tax collectors, the people you think he would be against. He was talking against the religious spirit, and why? Why? Because they were rejecting the God in him. Mm -hmm. They were rejecting the God in, in Jesus. Right. They believed in God, but they uh, didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Right. Know? They didn't believe in yeah. him as the Messiah. So they're continually and constantly rejecting Jesus. Now, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit came to testify of the witness about Jesus Christ. Jesus said, The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of me in John 15, verse 26. So we can plainly see then, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to continually reject the person of Christ whom the Holy Spirit testifies of. Study the Word of God closely. Who was Jesus speaking to when He spoke of the unpardonable sin? He was speaking to the Pharisees. And what they did, continually do. And that was that they rejected Jesus as their Savior and plotted to kill him on several occasions. They even accused him of having an unclean spirit, saying he has Beelzebub by the ruler of the demons. He casts out demons. Matthew 9, verse 34. Jesus' response to that was this, Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Mark 3, 28 through 29. Now, why did he say that? Well, the next verse tells us, Because they had said, or because they said, He has an unclean spirit. Mark 3, 30. The Holy Spirit is present even today to witness about Jesus. Therefore, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to keep on rejecting the gospel of Jesus and to depend on your own efforts to be saved. Jesus was warning the Pharisees not to commit that sin and to stop rejecting him. This clearly does not apply to the believer. You see, in reading the Bible, it's important to note who the words were spoken to and to ascertain if the words are relevant, relevant, <laughs> relevant for the believer. Relevant. In other words, are they instruction to the believer or are they recorded uh, an, a recorded event? In this case, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees who had rejected him and who had even made claims that he had an unclean spirit. Imagine their, their audacity. I mean, as for you and me, we have full assurance, which has been placed in our heart, that it is impossible for a believer to commit the unpardonable sin. Why do I say that? Because a believer has already received the gift of eternal life and will never be subject to eternal condemnation. There is a lot of confusion and wrong believing in the church today because most Christians read their Bibles without rightly dividing the Old and the New Covenants. They don't realize that even some of the words which Jesus spoke in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is one Gospel and four accounts of it, are part of the Old Covenant. They were spoken before the cross as Jesus hadn't yet died. Now, the New Covenant begins only after the cross when the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. I know no. that your Bibles are divided into the Old Testament and New Testament, which begins with the four Gospels. However, it's important to understand this and to realize that the cross made the difference. Pastor Karen? Uh, this was something new to me. I um, oh. Because uh, I always thought that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John were about the New Covenant. So I was really, I mean, I thought this was very interesting. Um, and I know that we take everything to the cross. You know, I know that uh, when someone has sinned or if they have some kind of an illness, mm -hmm. I always take it to the cross because I, it's where Jesus' blood was shed. It, it's where his blood was shed. So, um, And prior to that, all through his ministry, those three years of ministry, he was a practicing Jew living that life which was part and parcel of the old testament he was he, he living had come in the old to testament fulfill the law that's right he had come to fulfill it and so that didn't happen until he was crucified and was ascended you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when pentecost came and he said don't to the believers they were up in the upper room not to do anything just hang out in that upper room until he uh he sent the holy spirit as me i'm paraphrasing but anyway when and when he would send the holy spirit uh and that's exactly what happened. And from that day, the day of Pentecost on, was the New Testament. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I had heard that. That, yeah. that is so, uh, such a revelation uh -huh. to me. Uh, when I learned that, 
it was a revelation to me too. It was something that because we, we weren't taught that, you know, mm -hmm. from tra tra for tra from tradition, when we open our Bible and we end with Malachi and begin with the four Gospels, it's like, oh, New Testament, Jesus, mm -hmm. you know. And it does tell about Jesus. It's then he's revealed. He is revealed in the New Testament, but the actual New Testament, his testament, will and testament, doesn't begin until he died and was crucified, died, and was buried and resurrected. Amen. Because that is what a testament is. It's a will. It's his last will and testament. We we're taught about his coming and what he did and, and everything. It's kind of like a story that keeps going. And then, ta-da, you know, it mm -hmm. happens. So uh, we have to lear learn how to read the Bible and when we study it so that we know. And I'm and you know me because you've been with me for many years. Uh, we always have to break it down to a gnat's wing. So we always go back and see who is he talking to so that we can, is this a recorded event? All things are in the Bible for our benefit, all right? But not all of them are instruction to the believer. So we look for the instruction for the, uh, to the believer. Are we, is it a recorded event showing that God is capable of doing this and can do it again if he cho so chooses? Is it to drive a point home to show his strength and his, or point to Jesus Christ and the coming, uh, the coming Christ? Or is it an event that is to instruct us in how we should live and how what we should do as born again believers and who we are in Christ because if we're not in Christ we're we're not born again and we don't and no, I know that we can get born again and we don't realize we're in Christ we just need to know it so nobody's teaching it well they are now I've I've heard it a couple times now out there but but they're not really teaching teaching it you know and they need to put that uh, new creation in Christ Jesus should be explained to a gnat's wing so that you get who you are. Then from there, you can begin to learn to walk all over again. <laughs> because otherwise, we're not walking the right path. We're stumbling along and fumbling along and taking rabbit trails that don't exist and to lead us off into the never, never land. And, and then we come back with some wild and woolly idea that does not uh, uh, jive with the, with, the, with the Word of God. Okay, so... Uh, some of what Jesus said before the cross uh, was before the cross and some of what he said after the cross were spoken under completely different covenants. You also need to see who Jesus was speaking to. At times he was speaking to the Pharisees who boasted in their perfect law keeping and with them Jesus brought the law to its pristine standard. In other words, it was absolutely crystal clear then that it was virtually impossible for any man to keep the law. Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish, your pieces, parts of your body, than your whole body to be cast into hell. Matthew 5, 29 through 30. Well, let me ask you, have you done that? Do you think that Jesus expects us to do that? Or does he want us to rightly divide the word and understand who he was speaking to in that passage and what he meant? If the church was to literally obey everything that Jesus said in that passage, then the Christian world would look like a huge amputation ward. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, uh, uh, most of us would be walking around with a frontal lobotomy, you know? Yeah, because none of us could keep it, so... Uh -huh. So we, we'd be cutting ourselves I mean, up and... <laughs> I mean, this is a verse that uh, made me think, because I have a tendency to take the Bible literally and not to discern, maybe sometimes, uh -huh. and... Uh, I mean, this is something that that uh, I I looked at and thought, well, what does he really mean by this? Yes, you know, well, does... he said all of that to bring the law back to its pristine standard, a standard that ensured that no man could keep the law. He said that that said all that so that man would come to the end of himself, of depending on himself, and begin to see that he desperately needed a savior. All right. When we read the words of Jesus in the four Gospels, it's necessary for us to rightly divide the word and understand who Jesus is speaking to. Let me give you another small example. You may have heard some preachers yelling at unbelievers and using the term a brood of vipers, but Jesus never called sinners, not even the prostitutes and corrupt tax collectors, a brood of vipers. Never. Those harsh words were Jesus's uh, uh, and he reserved those for the Pharisees whose fixation on the law blinded them from seeing God in the flesh, Jesus, who gave the law in the first place and who came to fulfill the law on man's behalf. 
So we learn to rightly divide the word of God whenever you read the Bible. Not everything that Jesus said was spoken to the church, the body of Christ. Paul's letters were written to the church and are therefore for our benefit today. God raised him up to write the words of the ascended Jesus who is seated today at the right hand of the Father. That's why when it comes to reading the Bible, I now encourage new believers to actually begin with the letters of Paul. And it's through the letters of Paul that a new baby Christian will get the foundation of the gospel of grace. But I really should, I have to change that. Um, I, I really recommend is Genesis first so that the new Christian realizes that the blessing was given in the beginning and restored to us through the crucifixion of Christ. And then move on to the letters of Paul. And the blessing, by the way, is your empowerment as a, as a Christian when you were created. So uh, it's God's empowering you. So getting back to the unpardonable sin, which I keep going around a lot. <laughs> have you ever noticed that Paul never mentioned the unpardonable sin? Not once. Not one time in all of his letters to the churches did he warn the Christians about the unpardonable sin. If Christians could commit that sin, he should have mentioned it in every epistle that he wrote, don't you think? Mm -hmm. I mean, on the other hand, Paul did emphasize that Jesus, by his death on the cross, has made us alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Now, I checked the original Greek word for all in this verse, and guess what? All means all. Jesus, with his own blood, has forgiven you all of all your sins. So there's no sin that's unpardonable. You're not forgiven past sins and not your and not present. You have to work to do that. No, you are forgiven past, present, future, all sin. By one perfect sacrifice, Jesus has cleansed you of all the sins of your entire life and you are now sealed with the promise of eternal life through the Holy Spirit. And this is good news. No, it's great news that you'll establish your heart with grace and confidence. You know, Pastor, the only, and there are many scriptures where I have thought, oh, am I forgiven or am I not forgiven? Mm -hmm. But there is one thing I think that our listeners should be uh, cognizant of, and that is the uh, un unforgiveness. Isn't that something that will, uh, will hold us back from receiving all of Christ? Um, I mean, this, we don't have to talk about it right now, but uh, I always was led to believe that if there was any, un it goes back to the commandment, loving mm -hmm. your brother with all your heart. If uh, if we've been given all this grace from God, we cannot allow unforgiveness in our heart to prevent us from having all of God and preventing some, your brother from receiving the same grace that you have received. I mean, it, isn't that a... Well, unforgiveness in your heart blocks your blessing. Blocks the blessing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you have been forgiven of all sin, past, present, future, even unforgiveness. But if you aren't in forgiveness, we're also told in the New Testament that we should not uh, hate our brother. We shouldn't have unforgiveness in our heart and hold it because... Uh, it, it, if we will be judged accordingly. If we have unforgiveness, then God won't forgive us. All right, and people hang up on that one. But that's, that's true in this regard. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, then you, you are not forgiving, and God forgives you according to who you are in Christ. In other words, if you're not, if you're not how can I put this? Let's see. I think we should take this up as a subject. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, and we will do that. Maybe next week we can talk about that okay. uh, in depth. But if you're not, um, if you're born, when, oh yeah, let's just talk about it next week. Next week. <laughs> so okay. I can do it right because it's, yeah, what I was going to say is going to open up Pandora's box. And, and so, yes. <clears throat> yeah, we need to get, okay, we'll go into that in depth. Uh, unforgiveness. And that's a really good one. I'm glad you brought it up because uh, okay. we were going to have to talk on that unforgiveness. I'm writing a note. Uh, okay. And in relationship to grace. Okay. Because we need to go over that. All right. And that uh, is clarification. So stay tuned for next week's program when we go into that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But anyway, on the un unpardonable sin, um, uh, God doesn't leave you wondering whether you're saved or not. He tells you outright that you are his and that nothing can ever separate you from the love of Christ. All right. Then you know that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus when you are born again. 
All right. <clears throat> Nothing can separate you from Christ. Because why? Because you become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. You're born again through Christ. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, so <clears throat> not even sin because his blood is greater than your sin. All right. Now, okay. knowing that all your sins are forgiven is crucial for your health, peace of mind, wholeness, and wellness. The more you believe that all of your sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus, the more you will become whole, body, soul, and spirit. One of the things that I can say about unforgiveness is this. Unforgiveness is, uh, is something you're doing on your part that automatically blocks you from receiving all that you get, the, all the blessings that are right there for you to par partake of. We are given this regardless whether you're born again. When you're born again, you are forgiven. All sin, past, present, future. Unforgiveness. Um, um, well, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> you're okay. forgiven. All right. You should be able to plainly see the dangers of lifting the word of God out of context, though, by what I've just shared with you. We must be extremely cautious not to take a verse out of its context and build a teaching or doctrine around it like the Pharisees did. Bible teachings have to be confirmed by several supporting verses, and these have to be studied within their proper context. When you hear teachings that put fear in your heart and place you under bondage, don't just swallow them hook, line, and sinker. Look at the context of the verse and see if it's a new covenant truth or an old covenant teaching. Weigh it by who it was spoken to or written to and how it's applicable to you today. Remember this, all of the new covenant truths exalt Jesus and his finished work. All of them do. Okay, so that's all I have for you today in my stuff. Yeah, that was a really good teaching and one that we need. Uh-huh. But I think that we really should go into the unforgiveness factor and uh, apply it to this uh, next week because we need to be sure that everybody understands that. It's not, that, it, it's not that, condemnation. Otherwise, if you're in for un unforgiveness and you think that God's not going to forgive you because you're not... We are all uh, judged by the measure of faith and whatnot that we've been given. We've all been given a measure of everything, all right? And mm -hmm, we've been mm -hmm. uh, filled to overflowing because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts, all right? So if we love one another and start looking at one another through the blood of Christ, which is the way we should be seen, that's the way God sees us, then we will be forgiving. But if we're not, then we're, we're, not, we're out of God's will. You see, we're, yeah. we've stepped out of God's will. Now, it doesn't mean we're out of it completely. We're in his permissive will, but that's a very dangerous place to be. But enough said on that subject until I can explain it, and you can help me do that oh, completely yeah, we'll next, next week. Yeah, next week. No, it was just something Ooh, on my mind Somebody we were talking. A... Somebody called in? Okay, we have a comment. Yeah, <laughs> put my glasses on so I can see it. Uh, it says, do you have your own radio show? A mobile app would help you grow your audience. Get your app from... Oh, it's a commercial. Thank you, Robin Lynn, <laughs> for sharing that with us. We'll look into that after the, our program. Um, having a mobile app for you people that want to hear us on the go. Yeah, we'll look into that. So, praise the Lord. That was a great message. I'm glad somebody contacted us and, and asked uh, the question. Could you repeat it again? Because you were going in and out again. I don't know oh, the connection. The connection. Uh, the, the, uh, we had a Listen. question about from one of the Spreaker people that if we had a mobile app, it would help us grow our listening audience because people would be able to hear us on their phone. Oh, okay. If we had a mobile app. And, um, and so that was great, and I thanked her for chiming in. So obviously she was listening to us. Um, and uh, anyway, praise the Lord for that. But see how that works. They, they make a message, and we have a, co a comment, and we address it. That's great. Hallelujah. That's good news. <laughs> well, I think another thing is if we respond to God's grace with persistent rebellion mm -hmm. and opposition to God, um, that we're insulting the we're insulting the spirit of grace. Oh, definitely. Definitely, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But on the other hand, if we respond with a contrite heart and humbleness and seek forgiveness without hypocrisy, then the blood of, the blood of Christ can cleanse us from all sin. 
Amen. So I think we're talking about a heart attitude. Yes, also. definitely. You know, here's the thing. When we think about grace and people say, oh, well, if you're preaching grace, and then it's uh, God's love. And uh, that we, can't, we have no condemnation coming towards people to whip them into shape. You know what I mean? It's like uh, spanking a child. If you don't threaten with dad coming home with the whip, you know, or the belt, then you're remiss. Well, you know what? Uh, people say, well, if you're teaching only love, and, and which is grace of God and, and all the gifts of God, then it's going to incite people to want to run out, and we've talked about this before in, in previous messages, run out and sin all over the place because we've been forgiven of all sin. That's not true, because what happens when you're born again, you're changed. You're a completely new creation in Christ Jesus. Your heart's different. God takes out that old fleshy heart and puts a stony heart and puts in a heart of flesh. Not, mm -hmm. not flesh in the natural, but a fleshy heart. Oh, it's one that's soft and supple and re receptive. And here's the deal. I, don't, I can only speak personally about this, but I don't know any Christian who is born again who is so haughty and so full of himself that he thinks he's greater than Jesus and greater than God so that he can go around boasting and doing anything he wants to and think that he's not going to um, uh, have to answer for it. Yeah. You know, at the Bama seat of Christ, if he's doing that he and he's born again, he's still going to go to heaven. That's a promise from salvation. But he'll answer for in rewards being taken away. Uh, 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 and I don't know what what the end result would be of, of what his giant reward would be, like a big neon sign or, you know, flashing that uh, eat at Joe's or something, you know. <laughs> but, but, it, but when he's going to lose rewards and there is a price to pay, you know, and, and in the reward area, uh, God has planned this humongously wonderful uh, inheritance for us through Jesus Christ. We have uh, been given joint heir or joint reignership with Jesus Christ. And if you're plucked away by minus signs of all the stuff that you should have been rewarded for because of your attitude, which is what you were talking about earlier, um, you're not going to have anything left, <laughs> you know, I mean, very much anyway. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just did a teaching on that, on, uh, on heaven, and I started a teaching on heaven on the Master's Word. Um, so I encourage you guys to go on, on the website, uh, the ma the masters touch org and go to, uh, the master's word and listen to the last, the latest broadcast, which is always scroll down to the bottom. That's the latest one because it's a teaching on heaven. Um, and it get, it'll give you a head start and hang in there with me on those teachings every week because we're de definitely looking at the heavenlies and what we're, what our rewards are. And it'll all come together for you. And of course, this is really good to, to intersect with this teaching that we're doing here okay. on uh, grace because it's part and parcel of grace and everything is kind of wrapped up and we're just kind of spread out and teaching everything at once and everybody kind of gets into the, the lake with it, you know, in the pond and, and then it'll all come together for you better. Um, I would like to listen to that. But um, I, I am not a person who, when I was born again, I didn't, and I was a bad kid. I mean, I was a sinner. Was, and, and, and so, I mean, as far as that goes, I'm not a sinner now. I'm a Christian who is repented from sin, you know, saved from, from sin. But anyway, um, but I, I do make mistakes. I'll put it that way. Still. Uh we have the fountain of the blood of Christ, the, mm -hmm. and we have the grace of repentance. Amen. Um, that when we make mistakes. But my heart was grateful. You know what I mean? My heart is so grateful that I have been redeemed from going to hell, that if, mm -hmm. if that was the only thing I got, yay. You know? <laughs> I, I am so grateful to God that he has given me uh, redemption and then when I find out that I'm redeemed from everything I ever did and anything I'm doing now by mistake or whatever, even though I'm trying never to do what I'm trying to emulate Christ, and that in the future, anything that God has seen that I have done or stumbled and made a mistake there, that I've already been redeemed from that, it, it makes, it, uh, makes me more grateful than ever. I know. I mean, that's our you know? growth in Christ yeah. is when we do find ourselves maybe uh, 
sinning or we catch ourselves in a sin mm -hmm. we become more we our hearts become more grateful because we realize just what Jesus did for us the sacrifice that he made for us that's right and mm -hmm. and we're more humbled we're you know we're more humbled we we have more of that contrite spirit and and well, uh, I, I find that yeah and I find that we're more penitent immediately you know, yeah. it, it's an immediate thing because it's a revelation and it's like the Holy Spirit's right there on your shoulder, tapping you on the shoulder going, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And your conscience is saying, oh, no, don't do it. And you do it anyway, knowingly. And then immediately you just, it's like your whole heart caves in. <laughs> you just be like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. You know, and, and you become immediately but penitent, you know. Go ahead. And when we become humble, he can work with us. I mm -hmm. mean, we become that clay that the potter can work with. That's right. We're more, we're more malleable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the idea that people think, well, I can go out and sin and do anything I want and, and I'm forgiven. That's, that's not true. That's looking at it from a fleshly standpoint. If you're looking at it like that, then you're in the flesh. Because if you're a born again believer, you will know that that is not what you would do. You know, we would we wouldn't do anything knowingly that would displease the Father or Jesus. You know, or the Holy Spirit. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit, quench the Holy Spirit. We don't want to. We we work towards our works are, if you want to call them works, our works are toward emulating more and more of Jesus in our life, just becoming more and more like Him, and that's the way we're supposed to be. That's what Amen. the whole plan is. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's how God sees us through the blood of Jesus. We're, we're, he sees us as his son, you know, because of that blood. And it's only when you're born again that you receive that blood of Jesus. So that you are born through him and become every cell of your body has now got Jesus' DNA in it. You know, your bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And he doesn't sin, so why would you? You know? <laughs> Amen. So it's a it's a moot point for as far as I'm concerned, but I do know that it's a a walk to get there. It's a journey, and that's what we're doing here right now. Um, let's. Uh, you want to go into yeah, um, let's, communion? Well, I want to go into the altar call. I think so. Let's let's see right now um, what your desire is. I'm going to give you a few moments to think on what we have and reflect on what we've been talking about today. And to uh, give you an opportunity to kind of digest this and think about receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior.
You know, family, we always want to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus and to become a member of the family of God. And um, we hope that uh, there, if there's any listeners today that uh, feel that God is still angry with you, we want you to know that he isn't. He wants to have a relationship with you. So repeat this after me. Jesus, I believe that you are the son of the living God. I believe that you were born, you came in the flesh to atone for my sins and all of my sickness and disease on the cross, and you were raised from the dead after three days. I repent of my sins now, and I ask you to come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior now and forever. I thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy and compassion for me. And I take this opportunity now, to, and, and I choose to serve you all the days of my life. Family, if you've said that today, you, we welcome you with open hearts into the family of God. Glory to God. That's so true. Hallelujah. He 
up the elements of the covenant before the Lord as I pray. Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten Son, Jesus, gave his life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this bread becomes our portion of his healing body, the vibrancy of his life within us. We thank you that as we partake of the body of Christ, we become healed, made whole, and completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood that we are continually washed in his blood and renewed within as we perpetually remember his act of love on the cross on our behalf. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, amen. You know, is there a historical comparison with the communion service that we're partaking of today? Well, if we uh, look at uh, the Hebrew families, if we look at the Hebrews, we see that they sacrificed a lamb and put blood on the doorpost of their house the night before their exodus out of Egypt. Uh, in Exodus 12, verse 13, God said, you know, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you. So thus the Hebrew families were protected from both sickness and death as a result of the blood and body of the lamb that they sacrificed in Egypt. So we see that the appointed festival of Passover became the forerunner of the Lord's Supper, where the Lord Jesus himself, he becomes the sacrificial lamb, and his blood was shed on the cross for not only our sins, but for our complete sozo healing. Sozo meaning complete protection, complete healing, complete salvation, and complete deliverance. And in fact, we understand that Jesus was having Passover with his disciples when he instituted the Last Supper with the New Covenant. We've been talking about the New Covenant today where Jesus said no longer, well, we understand that the Hebrews no longer would emphasize deliverance from Egypt, but instead each time that they took the cup of juice or the cup of wine and the unleavened bread, that they would celebrate deliverance from sin and the promise of eternal life. You see, the blood of the Lamb in Egypt was a foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus, who was identified by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God. John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the historical application of Passover is that we see its prophetic fulfillment in Christ, who as God's final perfect Lamb died during the holiday of Passover. Communion also denotes a sharing and reminds us not only of our redemption through Christ, but also our future inheritance with him in the kingdom of God. Matthew 26, verse 29 says, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Now looking at the elements, the, the unleavened bread and the juice or the wine, the Jewish unleavened bread used during Passover was called the bread of affliction because of the Hebrew slavery in Egypt. But however, with the new covenant we've been talking about in Jesus, it is called the bread of life. Jesus said, I tell you for certain that Moses wasn't the one who gave you your bread from heaven. And the bread that God gives is the one who comes down from heaven to give life to the world. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. So you see, we're not only proclaiming the Lord's death through the unleavened bread and the juice, but also we're receiving a new impartation of life through this communion service today. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the representation of the bread and blood in communion service with you. We know that you have created life eternally, and every time we partake of your body and blood, we receive a new infilling of your life through the Spirit. You know, the Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship. It's a partnership with Christ. Partaking of one bread creates that partnership between the members as well, and it merges us into one body, the church. 
The Word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup, do this, perform this action, continually take bread, give thanks, break it, and eat it, and take it, take the cup and, and bless it, and then drink it, all in the remembrance of Jesus. And the Lord commanded that the supper be repeated often. Yet we're not given specific instruction as to how frequently the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated, and it is implied that it's to be done with frequency, so that partaking of the Lord's Supper continually recalls to our mind our redemption by Christ from all sickness, all disease, and all sin. So, my friends, do it as often as you want to and need to. As we are instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus, broken for you, so that you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you for the remission of sins. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. The Lord's Supper is a feast. It's a feast of living union of believers with the Savior, whereby we spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits and are nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life, and for that we are eternally grateful. Pastor Karen, can you close us? Let's, I would like to bless everyone. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. If, did you receive this today? We pray that you did. If you need further assistance with understanding the messages, do contact us. Pastor Karen's going to give you her contact information right now. Well, you can reach me at my email, honoringhands at aol.com. Uh, my ministry is called Refuge of Hope Healing. Uh, we have a live healing room here in Vilas, North Carolina, and we also um, have a healing room on the website, themasterstouch.org, scroll down to Refuge of Hope Healing Room. Um, my phone number is also 305-467-7232, and you can reach me through uh, Facebook, all the social uh, areas on the in internet. Uh, you can reach me under Karen Weitzman or under Refuge of Hope Healing Room, and I look forward to speaking with you. Okay, and my information, the website is themasterstouch.org. That's www.themasterstouch.org. My website, on my website there, you can reach me by Dr. Stephanie at themasterstouch.org. That's D-R-S-T-E-F like Frank, E-N-I, at themasterstouch.org. Or you can contact me through my regular email, masterstouchhs at cox.net. That's masterstouchhs at cox.net. Poet at cox.net, P-O-E-T at cox.net, or M-T-H-S prayer at cox.net. That's M-T-H-S prayer at cox.net. We want to thank you for joining us at, at here at Living the Word. And Living the Word is brought to you every Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific time, which is 1 p.m. Eastern and 12 noon Central. Remember, Proverbs 4, 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. And my dear friends and family, that's exactly what we're doing here, seeking God and gaining God's wisdom from His Word. Living the Word is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We're a 501c3 organization. And we leave you today with this reminder. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 tells us that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. So right now, however Jesus is, perfect, prosperous, abundant, full of divine health and wholeness, that's exactly how you are too. Meditate on that scripture until you become it, my friends. God bless you.
Spirit.